Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this issue briefing on resetting inclusion beyond COVID-19. My name is Amanda Russo. I'm the head of media content here at the World Economic Forum, and I have the, I have the, the pleasure and the privilege, <laughs> trying to combine two words there, of moderating this panel of two co-chairs and one friend of the forum. So thank you so much for joining. We have a lot to cover in 30 minutes, so I'm going to jump right in. So first off, just to get up, to give everyone on the on the line some background for the next 30 minutes, we're going to spend a bit of time diving deep into the issues um, and try to get beyond the headlines. Uh, for those watching this live stream, if you want to ask questions, you please do so, highly encouraged. Um, we, you want to go to the Slido link that's going to appear at the bottom of the screen. Um, that's uh, how we're going to try to get as many questions as possible into the next 30 minutes um, because today's issue briefing is on a very important topic equity and inclusion and from digital accessibility to dependence on the informal economy we all know that COVID-19 has really highlighted the role that every individual can play um, but how do we leverage the Great Reset to make sure that this is as inclusive as possible. So joining me today to help talk about these issues, we have Pierre Hubbard from the, he's the General Secretary of the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD. He's dialing in from Paris. Pierre, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm also joined by two co-chairs of this year's Sustainable Development Impact Summit, Hindu Omaru Ibrahim. She is the president of the Association for Indigenous Women and the People of Chad. She's also joining us from Paris. Hindu, thank you. And we also have from San Francisco, a very early bird, Tiffany Yu who's the CEO and founder of Diversibility. Thank you so much for waking up so early today to join us. Um, I'm gonna jump right into my first question, my privilege as a moderator. <laughs> um, Tiffany, I'd like to come to you first. Um, what are the headlines missing when it comes to inclusion and the SDGs, the, sustain the Sustainable Development Goals? Thanks, Amanda, and thanks so much for having me. And I'm really excited to see equity and inclusion represented on this agenda. I think I'll just raise three points. The first is that I think oftentimes when we think about the sustainable development goals, we're thinking about climate change and the environment. And there was a speaker in the last session who talked about how climate change isn't just about the environment, it's about highlighting inequities. And so I just wanted to highlight that for me, the SDGs are really centered on how can we incorporate equity and inclusion in every single aspect of how we're thinking about recovery efforts, how we're thinking about moving forward. The second issue I wanna bring up is intersectionality. So oftentimes we talk about the SDGs, like which SDG are, are you working toward or which SDG are you tackling? But the thing is, is that all of these SDGs, they're so comprehensive, right? So I'm proud to be a champion for goal number three, which is good health and well-being. But my work also tackles number one, S goal one, no poverty, goal 10, reducing inequalities. And so even on that point of intersectionality, I think it's really important to, at least for me, and what I would en encourage everyone to do, to, to have a disability lens on every single issue. Every single SDG is a disability issue. I'm looking forward, you know, Hindu's gonna talk about her work with indigenous communities. What's the disability lens on that? Pierre's gonna talk about trade unions. What's the disability lens on that? So just, um, I, I have in my notes here, but I'm tired of being seen as an afterthought. And oftentimes with the disability community, we're just kind of forgotten and then we're, we're tacked on to, uh, to support in the end. And even if I look at COVID response, the disability community has been so disproportionately impacted by everything that's happening right now. So I really am hopeful and optimistic that we can view this great reset as really bringing the disability community into every single conversation that we're happening. 
which leads to my third point, which is I've often heard a lot of people talk about how we really need to look at who's at the margins. And to be honest, I actually don't think, I think we need to reframe our thinking around who is at the margin because the people who are at the margins are actually at the center. And so uh, I guess my third point is that I would really, Oftentimes, I think when we look at the disability community, we're only seen as a beneficiary or, or a recipient of charity, but how can we really center and see disabled people as leaders and as co-creators of whatever future we're trying to create together? Tiffany, thanks for, for starting us off. Um, you kind of pre-intro Hindu for me. Um, so Hindu, I'd like to, to post you the, the same question, like, what, what are we missing in the headlines or what are the headlines missing? Thank you very much, Amanda. It's really a great pleasure to be on this panel and especially with uh, Tiffany and Pierre. Uh, so Amanda said, what is missing? It's the peoples that left behind. They're always the same peoples that left behind. When now we are seeing all the media on all the coverage are around COVID, but they are talking more about, okay, there are uh, those kind of infections just from developed countries. We don't have hospital or whatever. They come a little bit in flash about maybe what's happening to the, the developing countries and they forgot completely what is happening in the most impacted peoples who are the front line, the already existing crisis as climate change, as loss of biodiversity, as inequity, injustice, marginalizations. And in the top of it, we got also the COVID. So we are really left behind. And that's why like the headline are not expressing the SDG as whole, as global, the 17 goals that coming on. They just like selected what is coming in. So the second is the inclusiveness can make a country much stronger. If they include everyone, if they let us speak by ourselves, it will really make them more stronger and give them the realities of what is happening because the majority of the world population are women, are youth, are indigenous peoples, are people with disability, as children. So those communities who are forgotten completely need to be in the middle because when we talked about it, maybe we just are limited to wearing the mask or having the social distances, but there is no mask for us. There's no mask that making you out from the marginalization or from the discriminations. And if you lose all in the top, Pierre will come on it. Your job, we are not talking only about the money. Indigenous peoples are losing them homes. We are losing our land, our territories, our resources. And that is not considered in this time of speaking right now. So that thing needs to be in the middle of all the headline coming out. I mean, Pierre, let's, let's go to you with the same question. Um, what, what are you seeing you advise the OECD on these policies? What, what, what also are you hoping for? Thanks, Amanda, and thanks for giving, uh, giving me the opportunity to contribute uh, to this. I'll just actually pick up on, uh, uh, follow on, on, on Hindu's, Hindu's point, which is, as we know, this COVID-19 crisis piles over a number of unresolved issues, unresolved crisis. Uh, and Tiffany uh, as well mentioned that. And also the point that Tiffany mentioned, which is that we should not see disability or those who are most affected just as beneficiaries. And that means that when we, we have to see these people as people we have to invest in, uh, unexpectedly from a trading point of view, you know, uh, it is indeed there is a climate urgency, but there is this in looming inequality crisis that's been there for many years between countries, as Hindu have mentioned, but also within countries, both for the industrialized countries, a bit less actually, as we know, but all, but clearly for, for the global south. So what needs to be, what, uh, what is not necessarily missing, but what is perhaps needs to be highlighted further uh, from a trading perspective is, a reset, but also perhaps a, a rebuilding the labor market institutions that are needed for workers to have some minimum bargaining power for wages, for occupational health and safety, but also uh, for social protection. Uh, there was a previous WEF panel where a CEO came up with this uh, contradiction. He said, I'm paying competitive wages. My company is competitive. But when we do internal survey, we find out that 60% of our staff have difficulty to have ends meet at the end of the month. 
And that's not, the, the, uh, there is an issue behind that. So perhaps in the past 10, 15, 20 years, we've moved a bit too much towards individualization of risk uh, 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 in society and in labor markets. Uh, and we should perhaps shift back uh, the spectrum. So to finish there, perhaps two points, and I, I, in a way, if I may, I'm picking up a bit on, on what uh, Tiffany has been saying is, uh, one is to consider so, what we call social dialogue uh, between employer and union uh, as an investment. When you engage a conversation with local communities or when you engage a conversation, collective conversation on the labor market, uh, business should see that as an investment to uh, reduce transaction costs, to reduce risk. Uh, but also see social protection, solidarity as an investment. These mechanisms should not be seen as ways just to compensate the losers of globalization. They should be seen as mechanisms to invest in people, to invest in the future, and reduce risk on the long term. Thank you all. Um, just, just as a reminder to the people watching on, on live stream, uh, on the forum website. If you go to slido.com to select uh, this session, resetting inclusion to ask a question, it's hashtag SDIS. Um, thank you all for sharing these very important perspectives. I'd like to kind of narrow, narrow this down a bit and talk about actions, right? This is the impact summit. Let's talk about what are the impacts that you want to see, or maybe that you have seen already, uh, that we need to really scale up to make this the decade to deliver. Um, who wants to jump in first? I can Tiffany, go. go ahead. Tiffany. So I'm going to echo something that Pierre said, and he said, solidarity is an investment. And I know he's talking about that in the context of trade unions, but I really love that sentiment. So my action item is if I, I think that work, uh, dignified work is the solution for a lot of things. At least here in the US, it is still legal to pay disabled people below minimum wage. And even after 30 years of having our rights protected uh, through the Americans with Disabilities Act, unemployment before the pandemic was still hovering above 60%. So what I would like to see in terms of action is I need any private sector, even public sector, I need anyone and everyone to hire disabled people and to pay us well, because that is our pathway to economic sustainability, to adding value in society. And really, I think collective and, and in this whole spirit of solidarity and, and collective, it's like if we are able to achieve disability equity, justice, and liberation, we unleash so many other opportunities for other people as well. And, and Tiffany, are there any, or is there any like company or country out there that that you've seen maybe starting to make the moves to do this well? I mean, I think that stat that you gave about in the U.S. being able to pay workers. There, if, you, if you center on disability inclusion, if you hire more disabled people, your company will be more profitable, your company will have higher uh, profit margins. So, so the, the data is out there. I think we just need people to take action and to see disabled people, to see people with disabilities as a valuable asset within all levels of any organization and society. Technical, technical difficulties happen everywhere in the world, even here at the uh, SDI Summit HQ. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for filling in. Um, uh, Pierre, Hindu, um, concrete actions. What would you like to see? Or, or maybe what have you seen that is working? Hindu, you wanna come first, Hindu? Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wanted to see a lot of action because we talk a lot. We already read a lot of reports. There are a lot of evidence that coming out, but what is missing is the real action. And that's what we are calling for long time as indigenous peoples. So we need the action to rebuild our connection as human being with the nature. This one is completely missed out. So it is not like nature here and humanity here. Humanity are part of the nature. We are one species as tree, as insect, as bird, as all. So all of us are nature. So how we can rebuild this connection and we can protect 
each other. And we all know one message that I'm keeping saying, if we damage our nature, we damage our health. If we protect our nature, we protect our health. They, um, most than 70% of all the molecules that coming to create the vaccine or the, uh, the medicine that we are taking for treatment coming from the nature. They are not all 100% chemicals. So that's why the nature is very important for us. And then our, the food that we are eating, the water we are drinking, or the clean air that we are fighting for it, going to the street and cleaning, or the fire in California in where my, uh, my sister Tiffany is there now. All this is coming from the nature. If we rebuild our relationship, we protect the nature, we know that we are protecting ourselves. I wanted to see this action right now, but happening. And second, I wanted to see the respect of indigenous people rights. We are keeping the 80% of the world biodiversity. We are not taking the decisions. We are just seeing like, yes, you are doing a good work. We don't want people just to say like, yes, we are doing a good work, but look at the uh, exotic indigenous peoples, how they are wearing, how they are doing, uh, they are in them old life. It's not that we wanted to play our roles. Also, we do not want it to be a beneficiaries. We want it to be a partners because we have a lot to bring in this world through our traditional knowledge. We can help fighting all the climate and biodiversity. But if our rights are not respected or recognized, we cannot do that anymore. So we need those actions to become really concrete. And, and Hindu, we've, we've got a question that kind of came in on, on the Slido chat. How, I mean, and, and you've spoken about this at the United Nations. What is the best way to bring in the indigenous community? How, how is it it's through specific projects? Is it on a regional level? Is it on a national level? What's that step look like? So indigenous peoples need to be seen as partners. That's what I say. So partners cannot be bring only in a specific things. It has to be in all the process. So from the local level, indigenous peoples know better than land than even a satellite map who can be very intelligent. But in the indigenous intelligence are very important there. At the national level, if indigenous peoples' rights are respected or they are included in the decision making, we are seeing immediately how this country's economy can grow up and then peoples can live in harmony without conflict. At the international level, where the decision are taking in, in the behalf of the peoples. That's what is happening. That's why the youth are coming out to the street or all of us are claiming our government are not deciding. So if we come at the international level, sitting in the tables, deciding with all of them what we want, how we can design better our future, I think that's the participation can be full and effective in all the different levels. Okay, thank you. Um, Pierre, let's go to you. Let's talk action. What do you want to see? I would sum up in, in uh, three words, trust, money, and cooperation. Uh, trust, and Hindu mentioned, we need to consider indigenous community as partners. Well, guess what? Many unions would hope, would, would want business to consider trade unions as partners. Uh, let's be frank, in some countries, including in the United States, there is a good dose of hostility vis-a-vis -vis unions. So we need to have a positive dynamic here. I mean, and, and, and move away from the, a, you know, uh, a lack of trust, uh, between perhaps uh, some business and, uh, um, and unions to create a positive dynamic around that. Secondly, money. Concretely, there are negotiations at the OECD in Paris on tax. Uh, if we talk about funding, if we talk about social protection uh, for developing countries, we are actually talking about where the money is coming from and how. And you will know there is perhaps an issue of under taxation uh, uh, of, uh, of some businesses out there, there are uh, ongoing negotiation. Concrete deliverable would be by the end of this year to have an agreement on a reform of the international of the international tax uh, system. And third, cooperation uh, within the labor movement. We are campaigning for the creation of a global social protection fund. We did it when it comes to climate change. Uh, it is politically within reach. Uh, the issue is how can we raise money not only nationally but globally to help support so strong universal social safety nets in the developing countries and have all the right expertise. It is within reach. It is a matter of political will willingness. 
and to move away from perhaps where we have seen a couple, uh, uh, over the past two years, a retrenchment of, of, of countries, uh, rebuilds, resets the legitimacy of multilateral organizations. So trust, money, and cooperation. That's how I would frame uh, these, uh, 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 how we move ahead. I mean, trust is, trust is a really big issue. And Hindu, Tiffany, I'd love to get your thoughts on how, how do we rebuild this trust that, you know, is, is, is probably very much broken uh, across the board. Uh, what, do, what is your advice? I don't know, uh, maybe Tiffany, can we, can we start with you on that one? Sure, I, I was actually just taking a pause to taking that question because I think about, there was an initiative that was launched here in the US. So if you are reliant on disability benefits, you can, you can only have $2,000 in assets. And so there was something, and, and that's total assets, including everything that you own uh, and what's in your bank account and if you have a car. So there was an initiative that was launched during the Obama administration called the ABLE Act, which, which would operate similar to a college savings plan and would allow you to have up to $100,000 saved. And, when, and, and then that was un, unlocked state by state. And when it, was, when it was announced that it was launching in California, there was a, a big event that happened here in the Bay Area. I went to it and a lot of the, and there were so many questions from members of the disability community who were just unsure what was going to happen with their money if they put it into the savings account. Who, who, who was investing it? What's the return? How, how can I even trust this? And so trust, it's going to take time. And I think this is, you know, to your last question, Amanda, this is where action, I think, really matters. And Hindu talk, talked about how we just talk, we talk all the time. And, uh, and, and I, will, I will acknowledge even during this summit, I've seen a lot of corporations talk about the great things that they're doing, but I wanna see action, right? I want you to show me, at least if you're a corporation, I want you to show, show me what your disability hiring numbers are. Show me how you're retaining that talent. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say there is on, on this point of trust is it's, even during this pandemic, I think looking at the, at the delay of government response and how mutual aid efforts have emerged and how important those have become. And, and so I, I talk a lot about mutual aid efforts, even one of the projects that the forum highlighted was, was I'm, I'm shipping out windowed face masks to anyone in the disability community who needs them. Right? This isn't something to make me look good. I'm just trying to make sure that our community survives out of this pandemic so that we can thrive, thrive like so many other people. Thank you. And, and we have one question that's also come in very much linked to trust is about accountability. And Tiffany, I think it, it comes to your points about how do we hold companies accountable for what they, they say they're going to do. But, but before we get to that, Hindu, I just want to come to you about this issue of trust. It, it's you know, it's probably the, the starting foundation of where we need to go. Right. I mean, the word trust is really very, very important, especially if you are an indigenous person, because indigenous communities lose the trust from many other nations who come colonize us, who come like uh, kill indigenous peoples, take our land, take our territories, resources, kick us out. So it's really very hard to rebuild trust if there is no action. So we wanted to see the action that following the trust and Tiffany say, say that. So for us, it is not uh, just like making a declarations or making a paper saying, okay, we will come and do this and do that. No, we already saw that. We already saw many, uh, uh, I mean, like research communities who come to our peoples and who can stay like maximum 10 years and go back and write a document and say like, I'm a PhD because I'm expert of Bororo peoples or I'm expert of this one. And tomorrow they say they wanted to come back. We are like, no, we do not trust you anymore. You are coming stealing what we have, but you are not coming helping or supporting us. It is the same, the relationship we have with some governments and with many of the companies who come there. So how we can rebuild the trust? This is the most important question for me. So to rebuild the trust, 
we need to make it also as a process. We need to implement the free, prior, and informed consent of each communities. If we agree or we do not agree, they respect our decisions. And then we move to the next step, what we want to consider as peoples, we have also the word to say. If we say no, it is a real no, there is no negotiation. If we say yes, we move it in the way that we want it to move. And we see the action and we build up step by step, having all this trust. And of course, I mean, let me just come to your last questions about accountability. Please, if we yes. don't have the trust, so we need to see the accountability. And then many of the government are not accountable at all. And that's why we are also asking, we are standing up. We say like, we wanted to see what you are doing. If your Congress voted, if your uh, governments have to adopt it. So we wanted to see how our role are respected there, how you play it. So it's have to be the transparency and accountability. It is not an issue of coming with the numbers. The numbers can come, but it's not saying anything. But if we do not see it in a transparent way, an inclusive way, it will not have any other sense. And, and Pierre, you work a lot with, with governments, you advise international organization. How do we build in this, this um, the transparency and the accountability? Uh, that's a very good question, if I may. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, sadly enough, the first step is to give to have our governments, uh, the current administrations, uh, and hopefully the upcoming ones, uh, to rebuild, to give back legitimacy to multilateralism. And we are sadly very far away. There is, we are towards, in many, you, um, uh, you will know, uh, you know, uh, to, toward regional conflicts including in area in, in countries that we would not expect it. So the, where the preconditions is to give back some legitimacy to international cooperation and, and we are not there. Uh, uh, and we're not there. The question obviously is what can business do as always <laughs> to help support this positive dynamic? Uh, and I listened very carefully to what Tiffany and Hindu said. Uh, if I may, Hindu, come up with point that the labor movement uh, would also, but you would just need to reply, uh, replace free prior and consent, uh, informed consent with freedom of association. So I think what business can do is, I don't have uh, uh, obviously all the answers, but to create a positive dynamic around trust, recognize the key stakeholders of the firm. There are a number of them, uh, the local communities, workers, the tax collector, the environment, uh, and be serious about that. Be serious about that within business coalitions, but with multilateral organizations. And that I think is really key. Organization like the United Nations is a bit in the none is being questioned uh, somewhere, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that would be really the first step. Nothing is perhaps perfect with international organization, but the very principle of multilateralism, the very principle of, of international cooperation is something we should uh, cherish. And I can see it even in organizations like the OECD where you have national retrenchment. Nationalism and protectionism, this is the, mm -hmm. uh, the main threat that we are facing right now. It is that one that will uh, prevent us from building the much tr this discussion, uh, trust and the discussion we're having right now. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. And I think we only have time for one more comment. So I think um, Tiffany, um, very briefly, as a, as a global shaper, are there any um, shaper programs that you can highlight or you wanted to flag for the group in, in terms of this transparency and action and accountability stream? Sure. One, I guess I'll make two points. One is that there is a stat that the Ford Foundation came out with that said only 2% of international funding is going to disability advocacy. That means that 2%, that's nothing. And so if you know, if we talk about accountability, all of it is coming through in the data. We have 2% of international funding coming to disability advocacy. Unemployment rates, 60% before the pandemic. We really need to, to close in on those numbers. In terms of the global shapers, uh, there is an equity and inclusion steering committee. I am the global lead for disability inclusion projects and we will be launching, stay tuned in December, uh, the first Shaping Disability Summit. Well, I mean, I think I'm gonna be watching all three of you 
um, because I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for increased dialogue and, and action. And I know the three of you are going to help us keep uh, keep us on track for the transparency and the accountability and those action points that we need to really make this the decade to deliver. So many thank yous, uh, Pierre, uh, to my co my two co-chairs, Hindu, Tiffany, and to everyone who submitted those questions online and watched on live stream. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us today.